Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Launchpad. My name is Zachary Aubert. I'm the founder and network director here at TLP Network. Here at TLP, it's our mission to inform and inspire the explorers of tomorrow because we believe that space is better together. And today I'm joined by Dr. Stefan Brieshank, the chief operating officer and co-founder at Rocket Back. Rocket Factory Oxburg messed up the wrong part of the name too. Uh, RFA's mission is to democratize access to space and reduce the launch costs in the space industry. Stefan, thanks so much for joining me today. Zach, thank you so much for inviting me to this super exciting episode. And, and like I said before, I'm happy to answer all questions you have today. Awesome. Well, to start, maybe for those that have never heard of RFA before, could you share a little bit about RFA's mission and your startup history? Absolutely. We are basically a launch service provider. We started off in 2018. We're based in Germany. We have roughly 200 employees at this point in time. And believe it or not, we are a very international bunch of people. We employ people from 40 different nationalities. We only speak English here, and our motivation is to really resolve um, a launch vehicle that is super competitive. Um, it's smaller than most launch vehicles out there, um, but it has more than one ton of payload. We really want to cause a disruption when it comes to pricing and costing in the launch vehicle industry. So what's it like working with such a large group of international people? I know here in the state side, you know, we have ITAR, which if you're basically you're not from the States, you can't touch anything or see anything. What's it like working in Germany with that large international group? That is indeed an advantage that um, exists here in Europe. We do not have ITAR. We do have something equivalent, but it's not limiting or it's not um, basically it's not restricting you from really good talent from other countries. For us, it's really important that the best talent out there, um, that we find most motivated talent out there. And um, we have no other choice than to operate 100% in English. I would, I would love to change the entire city here, Augsburg into an English speaking place. It's, I haven't um, managed to do that such that you can basically, as long as you speak English and you know your engineering, you can come here and you can um, develop RFA1 with us. But long story short, Germany is a, a great place because it's a very international place. You can get around without having to speak German. And um, it's a true advantage to answer your question. It's a true advantage that we have this opportunity to welcome talent from all over the world to resolve the best engineering and the best products um, possible such that we can make a commercial business case. Such a, a great advantage. I know so many people that want to work in the States that can't, but it sounds like Germany might be that 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 new hotbed of innovation. RFA has taken a, a rather unique approach to development, going of a route kind of like an automotive company using an already established automotive supply chain. Can you take us through the decision to go more this unique route and how RFA has benefited from that? Yeah, absolutely. Look, when you look at launch vehicles, you realize that the first very unfortunate situation is that the um, payload mass fraction, which is sort of the commercial and somewhat the most the technical efficiency of a launch vehicle, scales with absolute size. The bigger a rocket, the higher the um, relative payload mass fraction. In other words, if you build a launch vehicle too small, then it will technically be very difficult. It will commercially most likely not resolve in a um, business case. So we basically looked at the, the launcher market in the very beginning and re realized um, really two um, main aspects. The first one is you can be competitive if you size the vehicle large enough. The higher the payload mass fraction and um, the more business is accessible and the more competitive you will be. And there is only really an option for a business case for a small launch vehicle. If you aim not too small, that um, for us is basically the one ton threshold. We believe that if you can't put one ton of payload into orbit, the business case is most likely not going to resolve. And the second point is that even if you have something that can deliver at least one ton, 
it's still going to be very hard to compete with the bigger launch vehicles that have a higher payload mass fraction if you do not produce in an automotive-like fashion where you can really bring down the cost through large production runs. And this is what we're trying to do. We basically said we are going to build a, an engine that is as small as possible, but at the same time, big enough to resolve the vehicle that has more than one ton of payload and at the same time industrializing such that we can build these engines very similar to how you would um, build automotive engines. So the helping also make it probably that you can work on more than one at a time because you need a total of 10 if I'm correct for RFA1. Exactly. The Helix engine um, right now in its first generation, there are um, numerous generations of it planned, but in its first generation, it produces about 10 tons of thrust. So for us, the first situation was we need to build something that has at least one ton of payload. And second, we need to build that launch vehicle in very large numbers, or at least use an automotive supply chain that is used to larger numbers. And that's basically what we've done. We have very few suppliers that indeed come from the aerospace environment. We have lots of suppliers that basically are already in the um, automotive um, industry. And they have a totally different approach to timelines and cost than some of the aerospace suppliers. For the development of Helix, this is obviously the first generation of it. What is a, a production runtime kind of from raw materials to an engine that's ready to, you know, test or launch kind of looking like. This will obviously pick up over the generations, but what are we looking at now? Well, the first couple of prototypes were anywhere between three months and six months. Right now, um, these times are obviously very long because they are prototypes, but in the future, we want to resolve um, our supply chain such that we can build, ideally, a couple of engines every day. Um, we have this vision that um, comes from the automotive um, world where um, in the big automotive companies a single technician basically builds and four engines a day and um, while we won't get there um, in the next couple of years this is basically what we are looking forward to um, generate here we want a, a supply chain and we want an overall environment where you can really produce these engines at very high numbers and quantities. As such, we do believe in engine clusters. You can derive that directly from that. And um, we want to basically make RFA1 as successful as possible by bringing down the propulsion cost, which is the major cost on a launch vehicle, quite significantly. So is this rapid production of them to fit a Kate launch cadence that you you know one a week type of thing that you're dreaming of or are we not even at that point of kind of thinking where we want to be for how frequently yeah so it's obviously going to take some time to get there but small launch vehicles are only competitive if you can basically offer them at a price point that is somewhat equivalent to the larger launch vehicles and the only real way to do that is to simply produce them in larger numbers. Now, a lot of rock companies out there have tried to do that. Um, at this point in time, I don't think that there is anyone that can claim that there are manufacturing rockets in the same fashion that smaller car companies manufacture cars. Um, and we want to basically disrupt the industry with that idea and with that approach, producing rockets in the same fashion that others produce cars. That'd just be amazing to see. I'm picturing this factory and it, it looks like it'd be super awesome. Despite the name RFA, you don't only work in Germany. You, can you walk us through kind of the locations of your operations and facilities, where they're located and what each one does? We'll, we'll dive into launch locations in a little bit, but for development and operations. Yeah, absolutely. So basically our headquarters are here in Germany. We're in a city called Augsburg, which is in the southern part of Germany, um, basically where the heart of the German automotive industry is. All big automakers are within um, driving distance from here. 
Um, this is where we do all our R&D and all of the tests that we can do. When it comes to engine testing, unfortunately, we have to go elsewhere. Right now, we're testing in Sweden. And um, we have basically a really dedicated and small team in Sweden that is doing engine testing there. And we also have a R&D and manufacturing team in Portugal that um, focuses on composites. And um, this is basically the current situation. We have these three sites. Most people are here in Augsburg and we're looking forward to now focus on um, some launch activities. And that means we have to move some of our staff to um, the UK. So why, so why Sweden and Portugal? Was there not an option in Germany? I, I remember checking, it's like 2200 kilometer journey up to the SSC in Sweden where you're testing. Uh, why up there? Yeah, so it's basically, you can answer the question by, we looked at all options at a time and we chose the best opportunity. We're always choosing the best opportunity at hand. And back in the day, the best opportunity was to go to Sweden because they basically um, had a, a large test facility, a large test range available where we could establish our um, test stand. And this is this was the decision back in go there and do all the testing. We do have rocket testing facilities here in Germany. And it is um, very unfortunate for us that we can't test there. There is one that is only a couple of hours away from here which would obviously suit us much better for what we want to do. But until today, we um, have basically been at this for four years and we haven't gotten a, um, an approval to test there, but we have an agreement with them that we will test there soon. Uh, milestones, you got it one at a time and uh, take what you can get as you go through development. Um, what What's the kind of journey like to doing a test up in Sweden? We know you've been doing some and are getting ready for some more because, you know, what's the timeline of having to ship components up to be ready to conduct a test uh, and, and navigating the weather conditions? It's, it's pretty far north up there. It's absolutely a big challenge. Um, getting the engines up there, getting the stages up there, I mean, is difficult, not too difficult because everything we do fits into shipping containers. But it is definitely a challenge. We also need um, export licenses, um, temporary export licenses to basically ship um, hardware up there. And then later on, it needs to come back to Germany. But it is a logistical challenge, which we have well under control. The more difficult one is, as you said, um, the weather. Um, there are many days up there where temperatures are below minus 30 degrees Celsius, and that really that is really tough. I mean, we have a super dedicated team up there, but it is truly ultra hard to be conducting these rocket engine tests in these conditions. I can imagine that. I live in the largest, furthest, most northern city in Edmonton in Canada. So I, I get minus 30 and colder and I don't want to go to school, let alone stand outside and test a rocket engine. Awesome. In weather. Zach, you're, you're the born test engineer for rocket factory. Well, we'll come well, cover I mean, some of the uh, we'll come cover some of the engine tests then. So now that we've got kind of an idea where your operations and development are underway, uh, your first rocket RFA one. When designing a completely new launch vehicle, uh, what component do you start with? The fuel, the tanks, the engine? Because every component affects every other component. So how do you start, or how did RFA at least start? Yeah, it's a, it's a good philosophical question, really. We believe that you have to start with the propulsion system. It's incredibly difficult to design and um, then later on operate a launch vehicle. It's completely different to anything else out there. If you compare it to a car, if you design a car, you test it, it doesn't really matter if it ends up being a little bit heavier or have performance, you can still sell it, it still works. With rockets, that's very different. If you look at a launch vehicle taking off, always keep in the back of your head that only one to 2% of this total mass launching ends up a satellite in space. It's extremely difficult. It's at the absolute edge of what's physically possible. And if all of your engineers make a one, two, 3% mistake, then nothing will get into space. All systems are highly coupled. You can't really 
develop any system in isolation. And that's why for us, it made most sense to start with difficult system, which is Helix, our rocket engine, because virtually every other system um, depends on the engine. So we started with a propulsion system, we start, started with Helix, and the more we make, um, the more we progress with Helix, the more we um, get into developing all the other subsystems around it. For us, a rocket is basically an engine that is then put into a cluster, and then you just add a whole lot of sus subsystems around that engine cluster. So RFA-1 is a three-stage orbital rocket. The first stage has nine Helix engines, and the second stage has a Hel uh, Helix vacuum engine. Um, mm -hmm. Can you take us through the, how Helix got its name? It was from the public, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, we basically ran a quite large social media campaign. Um, we came to no agreement internally on um, how to call the engine. So someone came up with this idea of letting the public choose I think we were the first, um, the first people that, um, the first company that um, basically said we're going to do this. We were quite scared because we thought it's going to be a couple of silly um, rocket engine names and everyone's going to vote for them. But no, it worked out really well. We got almost 4,000 missions and um, our team internally, basically they picked out the, few um, the submissions that made most sense and basically got most votes and um, that's why we ended up with helix and it's really it's really um exciting to see that basically the name helix um, basically is associated to the dna the human dna it's basically the core of um, human life and it's very similar in, in a rocket i mean the the engine defines everything it is the dna of um of what of the rocket that, that's awesome a great way to get the community involved i remember seeing that on social and helix was yeah. definitely in my what, kind of top three nice and what, what what when you say it was in your top three what was your number one guess or bet i, I thought it was gonna be between helix and redshift i felt like redshift okay. just sounded like an engine name yeah yeah so redshift but... is a really cool name but um i know that we haven't we haven't um thrown that away completely um but helix has been now in development for a number of years um in 2020 you made a switch from a, a gas generator cycle to an oxygen rich stage combustion uh combustion can you take us through kind of the development helix has gone through and where it stands today and why this larger development change in the middle yeah so um to give it basically again and if to frame a little bit the context around it what we basically started with is we started off with a, an ESA paid study where we were basically allowed to spend about a year to come up with all sorts of different concepts and what we have decided to do is we took an optimizer that can optimize many many parameters at the same time and we fed this optimizer with a whole bunch of different engine configurations, with all sorts of different um, geometries, with a whole lot of different manufacturing methods, materials, number of stages. We basically left everything open. And then we ran this study and something quite, yeah, I would say disruptive was concluded out of these results. The first one was that for some reason, the optimizer always used stainless steel. And we found out later on that this is obviously due to the cost. What we did with this optimizer is we basically coupled it to a large cost database where it could go in and basically ask, okay, look, if I choose composite, if I choose stainless steel, or if I choose stage combustion, or if I choose a gas generator, how will that affect the payload to orbit in terms of cost? And um, the decision to build the rocket from stainless wasn't really ours. It was done by this um, by this optimizer that we basically engineered. And with the engine choices, we basically concluded that stage combustion is definitely the best way to go. It always resulted in the lowest payload to orbit um, cost numbers. 
And we weren't sure in the beginning because we thought it's going to be super difficult to build a staged combustion engine. No real um, rocket startup has done it in small and has shown that you can do that um, on the quick with very little resources. We basically scouted around. We looked at every single copter that had staged combustion technology and we engaged with them. We tried to purchase componentry and we've basically said, look, it's so risky. Let's at least design two engines on paper, a classical gas generator, and um, at the same time, look into a staged combustion motor. And, uh, but to be very clear, uh, the optimizer always told us, look, it's the best option to reduce the cost to orbit. And it's very, very, um, it's been a big effort and it's very cool to see that um, we now have a running stage combustion engine. So what has been testing been like since making that shift? Kind of what testing has already been done with Helix and what's left to do to kind of certify it for flight? Yeah, so basically the first Helix we put together, we really put all eggs into one basket. We um, were able to purchase some of the machinery, um, the turbo pump and the pre-burner from elsewhere. And we basically developed the chamber ourselves. It's fully 3D printed. Um, we decided to make it from individual components, not just one large, um, basically printed chamber. It ended up being a very good um, choice. And we built this engine. We used a lot of automotive valves and sensors on that. We put all eggs into one basket. We tested it. And when we ran it for the first time, we um, got all the starting sequence right enough for it not to dissolve and blow up. And this was really one of the biggest breakthroughs we have achieved. Typically with these stage combustion engines, the startup and shutdown processes are super difficult, much more difficult and nothing comparable to a gas generator. And we've managed to get this right from the get-go. And after that development engine, we basically went straight back to the drawing board we designed a, um, an, an engine with 10 tons of thrust that is as slim as somehow possible so you can cluster the engine. And um, yeah, the first article of that very first prototype Helix engine then ran in our, at our test stand in Sweden last year for a total duration of 74 seconds. So that's basically where we stand right now. We've performed this test. We're building more Helix engines as we speak. If you would have the opportunity to ever come to Augsburg, please feel free to do so. We show you around right now. We have um, Helix engine number in the integration um, area and Helix engine number two, we mounted on a prototype upper stage that currently is in Sweden. And we had this prototype upper stage in Sweden since um, October last year and we're waiting anxiously to do the first hot fires on the entire stage there. Some uh, exciting milestones, getting to actually get to see all the work actually get to ignition. You you mentioned um, kind of talking about restartability, the startup and shutdown of these engines. Can you take us through a little bit about the complexities of not only ignition, but why shutdown has to be performed so carefully um, and why restartability was so important to Helix? So the restartability is something that you need simply because you need to bring the product um, to the launch pad. And before you have the engine at the launch pad, you need to, you want to at least hot fire the engine for acceptance by itself. And you want to hot fire it, it at a second time on the stage. And then you want to basically carry out the flight. So at very least the engine needs to be restartable at least three times. And um, yeah, the, the starting and the shutting of these stage combustions is engines is super difficult because you basically have gaseous oxygen that in many cases is um, basically at um, a high enough temperature to auto ignite with anything that is in its path. If you look at a gas generator, you basically inject the liquid oxygen at cryogenic conditions. And um, the liquid oxygen and cryogenic conditions is not as dangerous 
as um, gaseous oxygen that is basically at the auto ignition point. You can look at a staged combustion engine like a piece of Swiss cheese. You've got thousands of small channels um, for cooling, for regenerative cooling. And if the um, hot oxygen gas arrives just a little bit too early, you have um, this oxygen gas that wants to auto ignite everywhere in the Swiss cheese. And as soon as the kerosene comes, you get ignition in the wrong places and the end result is an engine that basically doesn't produce thrust more than um, once and you see a big bang. So this is basically the complexity. You have to time um, the oxidizer and the fuel um, at the right, sort of to the right point. And that's just something that is very difficult on these engines. I hope that answer wasn't too long and I hope it didn't lose anyone. I think no, it was good. It was a great way of being able to kind of picture it because it is, as you said, a very complex and it has to be done right. With restartability, would that ever open the opportunity for you know RFA one to be able to be reused and recovered? Then, yeah, absolutely. Like I said, the engine needs to be restartable just for the basically for the operation and for the basically from for the path from building testing it to do the stage test to um, the actual flight. And um, we obviously pushed this envelope. We wanted the engine to be infinitely restartable. At this point in time, we know how many times it can restart and that's enough to carry out the first launches. At a later point, we will obviously look into reusing the first stage because that's where all the cost is. If you look at um, the first stage booster of our vehicle, you see nine engines and every one of these engines is costing us roughly the same amount than the stage. Um, in other words, basically most of the cost is engine cluster and in the propulsion system and you definitely wanna recover that. If there's any way to recover the first stage, in particular the engine cluster, you would wanna do it. I think you are muted now. There we go. Go oh, technology. <laughs> uh, nice. Interesting hearing that the cost of the stage is close to the cost of an engine. I don't think I've heard that from some of the other companies, but it makes sense on why, especially that first stage recovery seems to be what everyone's prioritizing rather than the okay. second stage. Uh, have you dreamt of ways you're going to recover? Are we pull in a rocket lab and getting a helicopter in the air or pulling a Falcon 9 and landing it itself. All great concepts. We think the parachutes make a lot of sense. Um, helicopter, great idea. The issue is that at some point the helicopter um, has to become too large, or in other words, there are no helicopters anymore with that sort of payload. Um, we would want to consider um, recovering it with parachutes. The parachutes in themselves are very complex. It's not easy to open parachutes at supersonic and um, sonic speeds. And that's why we're going to push this out for now. Uh, we have concepts, we have partners, we have studies, we have done some engineering, we know where we want to go, but we certainly don't put any engineering focus now on reusability. All of the engineering focus is on resolving this first flight. We need to get into orbit before we do things like um, reusability. Yeah, prove the rocket before we, we start working on the other parts. Makes total sense. Looking further up the rocket, we have the, the third stage or the orbital stage, and it's rather unique as it, oper uh, as it functions as an orbital transfer vehicle, but also uses a green propellant. Why did mm -hmm. you guys choose to go this unique route, and what kind of opportunities does it open up for RFA-1? And quite interesting. It was actually, again, it was a part of the study that we did in the very beginning. We realized that um, there are propellants out there that are quite inexpensive, um, that are safe to use, very important. If you use um, hydrazine, for instance, it's um, difficult because all the occupational health and safety measures end up costing you a lot of money. So um, it's a it's a commercial decision not to use hydrazine. At the same time, obviously, hydrazine is um, poisonous. Um, you don't really want to use it until you, unless you really have to. 
And then the second point was obviously the propellant of the orbital stage should be storable, but long time, long term storable. We want our third stage has a, to be in orbit for a long time. As you know, the um, third stage redshift is a um, hybrid between a third stage and an orbital transfer vehicle. Its primary function is to basically generate the last bit of dv to actually get into orbit, but then at the same time, it has a lot of propellant left on board that can be used to raise orbits or to change inclinations. And it was very important for us that this orbital stage in its hybrid functionality has a um, propellant combination that you can store for long periods of time. And there's not many out there. There are some propellants that you can store for a limited period of time. We said we want to go all the way. We want to have a propellant that you can store for um, more than a year if um, there is a, a, a mission that asks for that. So with Redshift, what type of orbital services can it offer? Is it specific to kind of the payload that it's releasing? Or could it also have kind of secondary missions once it's released its primary payload? Absolutely. We basically said we want to be as flexible as possible with Redshift. What we can do is we can offer secondary services um, such as orbit um, raising or inclination changes. And we can make we can couple that with the actual amount of um, propellant that is left on redshift after basically getting the primary cu um, customers into orbit. In other um, words, we can basically shift payload that we haven't sold into fuel on this orbital stage. And if the rocket launches without that many customers, we can carry a lot more fuel on the orbital stage to do secondary services. And we have had quite a few um, customers that are very in that also using our third stage as the actual satellite platform. So you could imagine that some missions look like the following. The orbital stage pushes the primary customer into orbit. Then there's a lot of fuel left for um, a secondary customer, but that secondary customer is not a satellite. It is just an instrument. And that instrument uses the orbital platform to basically go to a different altitude and um, change its inclination over the course of many months. It's interesting concept with it actually using Redshift as kind of the base structure for something. That'll be interesting to see get used with using, obviously your primary payloads are gonna be what determine your trajectories and inclinations. Um, will Redshift have the ability to kind of change and phase to be able to go do secondary or is it gonna be more targeted towards you know what's right around us in the nearby region no absolutely we can deploy secondary customers into any orbit that allows for it depending on how much dv we can still do so that's a really unique advantage in some missions we can do more than two kilometers a second of dv on um, on redshift for a secondary mission amazing Looking at your 2022 user guide, you've got three different fairings uh, listed. Can you talk about why it was so important to have different fairing options kind of right from the start um, or these kind of longer plans for down the road and kind of the benefits to each one? Yeah, so first, you can't just basically make a different fairing for an existing launch vehicle because then the aerodynamic loads are different and um, it basically has an influence on how you build um, the rest of the how much pressure you basically carry in the tanks while you're ascending and we said from the very big customer is um, basically the customer is king and we need to offer a variety of fairings and for us it was really important that we design the um, launch vehicle such that any of these fairings that you see in this payload user guide can easily be made without changing the launch vehicle I tried to describe this before, how difficult it is to resolve the engineering on a launch vehicle. You only have a few percentage of the total mass that end up as payload into orbit, and there's not a lot of margin that you have. So typically, if you would design a fairing 
for a launch vehicle, the typical situation is that on the line, um, you want to use a different fairing and it's not just making a different fairing. You would realize there are a whole bunch of engineering changes on the upper stage required, potentially the first stage. And we wanted to avoid this by really capturing the full um, range of potential options that customers have asked us for. And um, we basically said that we're going to do the engineering such that we can adopt different fairings without a big fuss. And this is why you see numerous fairings in the payload user guide. All of these are possible. Of course, for first flight, we use the simplest one. And there was a, a standard fairing, an extended fairing, and then there was one that kind of flared out. Was that just to offer kind of a greater width to a payload or possibly like a ride share type idea with smaller CubeSats? It really depends on the satellite. There are some satellites that are really dense where you don't need a hammerhead fairing, but there are some satellites that have a very low density. And there are also ride share missions, as you outlined, where the overall density is really low of the overall payload. And that means you basically, for the same mass, um, you just need more volume. And these hammerhead fairings are basically the best solution to, to offer that. They have a, another range of, um, particularities about them. But um, long story short is we have designed this launch vehicle such that we can also resolve this hammerhead fairing later on. Awesome. Um, once you have the rocket, you need a place to launch. We kind of talked about a little bit. Um, you guys currently are looking at using um, Saxoford and Shetlands, and I believe the French Guiana. In the past, we've seen places like Norway listed and uh, some other locations that are being considered. Um, what prompted the choice of this really far north launch location and possibly something uh, closer to the equator? And, you know, what, how did that decision come about where you wanted to launch from? Hmm. I, very similar to how we um, basically chose our test site. I outlined this before. We have to, as a startup, we have to basically act in a very opportunistic fashion. If we want to do something, we have to look at what is the best commercial deal, where do we see the lowest technical risks, and then we have to make a call. We can't keep these trade-offs open for long. We have to make a decision quickly, and it needs to be a commercially good one. Um, startups are always strapped for cash, so we basically went to um, make a decision here at some point um, in last year. And um, the best option one and the best option both commercially and basically looking at all the technical risks and all the political risks, etc., cetera, um, was to go to the Shetland um, Islands. And we, we saw some photos and videos of you guys getting set up there uh, when you announced that your first flight. Um, can you talk about the benefits of that location? Why why Shetlands was such a great option to launch from, not only just financially, but for actually RFA one's future. Yeah, obviously the most important thing is that the flight termination and the flight safety corridors are really large. Um, if you look at that location on a map, you realize you basically most of the trajectory is um, over open waters. There's not a lot of air traffic there. There's not a lot of, um, just not a lot of sea traffic. And this all makes it very, very suitable to carry out a first launch. A lot of the first launches fail, unfortunately. Rockets are so difficult to engineer that almost all first launches go wrong. And this is difficult because if you look at launch sites, obviously launch sites do not want to, um, launch rockets that don't work. It's very difficult to find a launch site that wants to do a first maiden launch. It's not easy. Every All these launch sites say, yep, we want to basically host all um, launch vehicles out there. But if you then go into the detailed discussions, you realize not that easy. And um, for us, some of the best discussions we had were the discussions we had uh, in the UK. And um, we are very, we're really looking forward to uh, basically go there now with our first stage for the first stage um, hot fire tests and then conduct our first launch from there. So is French Guiana still something that we would see down the road or are there other 
spaceports in you know the U.S. to the southern hemisphere that are being considered down the road. After obviously, we'll get through the first flights uh, out of the Shetlands first, though. Absolutely. I mean, we would love to go to other launch sites as well. Obviously, this comes with an investment. We very much want to establish Rocket Factory in the same fashion than some of um, these German automotive manufacturers established. They basically manufacture in any location in the world where it makes sense to manufacture. And for us, that is very much the same philosophy. We want to build this launch vehicle in any location that we um, that makes sense uh, to build components and launch vehicles. And we want to launch from wherever it makes sense to launch from. So certainly, um, French Guiana is a great location to launch from. And that's certainly on the cards that RFA1 will hopefully one day um, carry out a successful launch from there. You touched on it a little bit earlier. Everything you're doing, it sounded like, was fitting into shipping containers. So you can take us through kind of the logistics of being able to, uh, there's quite a bit of travel. You're going Portugal, Germany, Sweden, and then over to the launch site in Shetlands. Kind of the the logistics of that. And is do you have kind of a, a dream timeline of what it would take to, you know, okay, we need to build a rocket for this customer and get out to the pad once you kind of iron out all the, the learning of these first flights? Interesting question. It's basically, we always built the same launch vehicle and the launch vehicle is flexible enough um, from the very first moment such that we can accommodate any sort of particular wishes that the customer has. So for us, it doesn't really matter how long it takes to start building one particular launch vehicle to when this particular launch vehicle is on the pad. So what matters for us is simply cadence. We just want a launch vehicle finished, ready to launch, ideally every week. And we know that we basically have done everything we could when uh, during the engineering and development phase to accommodate everything the customer wants. I mean, Redshift is a great example. This um, third stage hybrid um, OTV uh, has a very, very large um, flexibility. We can do basically everything that customers have asked us to do. And it doesn't really um, matter which launch vehicle the customer gets. The launch vehicle is always the same, but it we have so many different valves and screws that we can basically adjust the launch vehicle to exactly what that customer wants that we don't have unique launch vehicles. They're always the same. It's a great way of doing it, making it extremely universal. That way it's not specific uh, to each customer. It definitely opens up more opportunities there. Looking towards the first launch, as you've kind of touched on a few times, a lot of testing uh, has already been completed. Where does RFA1 stand right now, the components for that first flight? What's already been completed? Yeah, so we basically, if you would come to Augsburg, we would show you around. Helix engine number three, that is basically completed right now downstairs. We have um, a first batch of 12 Helix engines that are basically being put together as we speak right now. We have the second stage prototype, which we do intend to use for flight if everything goes um, as we plan. That is in um, Sweden. Uh, basically since October, and we are going to do a, a number of hot fires on that upper stage to basically verify the total impulse and um, the efficiency of the ISP of the engine, including the starting and shutdown, including a long duration burns. And then once we're completed with that, we're focusing on doing the same thing on a bigger scale, which is basically then the first stage. The first stage you might have seen some videos. We have taken one first stage, the very first we've built, and we basically brought that to destruction on purpose to see what the limitations are and where failures would occur. And we've built the first flight variant already, and it's right here in Augsburg. And we are basically in the integration of that first first stage. So for first flight, basically everything exists. We have started the, um, the first batch. We produce, in fact, 12 engines. We need 10 of these engines for the first flight. 
We have the second stage prototype, which we are planning to use for flight, which is tested in Sweden. And we have the first stage, which is build number two, which is in our facilities in Augsburg. And it's just about being integrated. Then there is the fairing, it's a composite fairing and redshift that are coming together um, in its details um, in the next, in basically this year in Portugal. And, and how does integration look before heading out to the launch pad? Are you going to have a kind of a fully stacked rocket that you're shipping over or will the first stage and separate stage kind of arrive separately and then actually get fully stacked and integrated out at the Shetlands? What's that operations like? Yeah, that's a very good question. We basically put a lot of engineering focus on making sure that the integration effort is as easy as somehow possible. And um, we want to be able to ship the um, vehicles in the smallest possible elements. We want to just ship stages and we want to ship just engines. We do not want to build and integrate everything in one facility and then have that huge logistical effort to ship that entire vehicle. We look at it in a very different fashion. We don't care which rocket engine is basically on which vehicle. Um, if we do the, the acceptance hot fire of a first stage and we find that the performance of these particular engines is not there for that particular customer, then we want to replace engines quickly. Long story short, we have put a lot of focus in making the interfaces simple, such that technicians can basically tear apart a launch vehicle and put it back together as quickly as somehow possible. And our logistical chain um, is not focused on shipping entire launch vehicles. We hopefully produce these um, Helix rocket engines at more than just one location. Um, if there are any opportunities in the future to go somewhere else to produce these rocket engines elsewhere, we will hopefully um, be able to bring, bring that up and get that opportunity in place. We will have multiple sites um, in the world to produce the engines and the stages. Talking about the the engines and the the interchangeability uh, and for them, uh, thinking to the earlier Falcons, they had developed them more in a square formation and they weren't interchangeable. Are Helix universal in the circle at the base that they can be changed, or are they designed specifically? You know, one, two, three, four. They obviously are universal. This is the entire sort of key aspect of accelerating a launch vehicle development program. You need to keep the engine size as small as possible. If you look at the complex rocket engine, it's immense. You do not want to start with a large engine straight off the bat. It's really difficult to um, resolve them. You need a lot of tests. A lot of these tests will basically go wrong. A lot of these tests will deal with lost hardware and you want to do that on small units. It's all a lot cheaper and a lot faster if you do it on smaller units and then build clusters. And um, this is exactly what our focus is. We have built a small engine. We want to make that engine as performant as somehow possible, as reliant as somehow possible, but we want to keep the engine size as small as it is possible, um, such that the overall product is still commercially viable. Makes sense. So looking to a, a future, you kind of touched on a little bit, the small sat launch market is growing quite rapidly, um, and there are many different launch providers coming online. What makes RFA stand out from these other launch providers that exist, and um, how are what what part of the market are you looking at capitalizing on specifically? Great question. We basically, when we started, we realized basically a lot of launch vehicle companies are already developing their launch vehicle. We are once that entered um, this entire um, new space launch vehicle development um, game. And we wanted to make sure that we are not going to develop something that is not competitive. And what that means for us is that we want to basically get to a first launch with the absolute smallest amounts of funds. And we want to basically generate um, and engineer a product that can compete with the most competitive offers. 
we looked at the most competitive offers, which are um, coming from right now, the most competitive offers you can get are often um, coming from SpaceX. And we said, we need to compete with that same offer. We need to offer um, basically almost the same relative price per kilogram. And this is basically what started all of, um, all of what we have today. Back in the day, we generated a mass model and we generated a cost model for basically every system. And we said, if we don't hit these cost models, then uh, we will not be able to compete. And I think we're doing really well. We are challenging uh, these cost models more or less on a daily basis. But so far, we have resolved something that can really hit that target that we have, which is about 5,000 euros or 5,000 US dollars per kilogram. And um, obviously, we don't. Um, we would like to sell it um, according to demand. If there's a lot of demand, we will sell it for whatever makes commercial sense. But um, the target for us is really focus on a design that takes a lot of components, a lot of processes out of the automotive field, and resolve that relative payload cost of um, five grand. Program. You mentioned it a little bit there. That obviously, the cost of operations we've we've seen recently. There's a few launch providers that have been struggling, having to go through refinancing and trying to figure out their future. How has RFA made sure to kind of build a foundation to make sure that even through these hardware failures that you're going to have in these first tests and then first flights, possibly um, that you have a future that you'll be able to, to navigate those those failures. Yeah, so this was for us a really fundamental point. We um, we realized what's happening out there, and we said, since we're late to the game, to basically resolve an in where we can tolerate at least one launch failure and um, get this product working as quickly as possible while having very little funds. And Rocket Factory is quite unique because we, at this point in time, we have a strategic investor, OHB. We're basically the only rocket company out there that doesn't have um, venture capital at this point. We have an investor that basically brings us payloads. We have um, basically more than enough payloads to launch. Um, the problem for us is, can we resolve an engineering product to be commercially competitive? That's the, the, the core question. For us, um, we can basically focus on the engineering and the product a lot sharper than other companies that might have venture capital, um, which basically means that you have to do an IPO as quickly as possible and multiply um, the valuation as quickly as possible. For us, these aspects don't, um, they are not as relevant as for some of these other companies. And um, this makes us really unique. Like I said, we're the only rocket company um, in the new space domain right now that has a very large satellite company backing it up. We basically have our customer already um, basically in the back saying, look, we have enough payloads. You just, the engineering needs to be good enough and you need to offer a commercial price that is better than basically right now every other small launch vehicle out there. So how does that work with then looking for, uh, or have you not even begun looking at other customers and how do you uh, kind of convince those companies to take a risk flying on a newer launch vehicle that isn't uh, proven? How do, you, how do you get them to risk their payloads? Great question. Basically our focus is to complete this first launch or to complete a first orbital insertion as quickly as possible. We have um, won a competition, as you might know, that basically allows us to fly the first mission with a number of pre-selected customers. And we basically already have the first flight customer set. Um, we already have the first flight configuration set. We just need to get to a first launch now as quickly as possible. So looking forward to that first flight, what what are we uh, hoping to see in 2023? Is the flights possibly this year? Or are we looking early into 2024? If everything as planned, then a flight in 2023 is possible. Now you have to ask the question in how many 
rocket and rocket engine developments does everything go according to plan you will probably find an answer out there and um, we are super excited as i mentioned before we have started to build the first batch of engines we are building 12 engines right now and we have resolved all three stages for that first flight looking at the space industry that's really starting to take off in europe and the uk we have this this new generation, you're talking about the best and the brightest that are looking at the space industry now as an option for their career. What encouragement or advice would you give them on why they should choose space and why maybe even RFA in their future? First of all, space is incredibly difficult. I would go as far as to say that if you have engineered a space product, you have a very good foundation to engineer everything else out there. It's that is particularly true because I've tried to give you that picture before where only one to 2% of the total launch vehicle um, gross liftoff mass ends up as satellite in orbit. It's incredibly difficult. You can't get there by simply sitting on your computer engineering and simulating. You need a hands-on mentality. You need to break things. You need to push things to the edge. Um, it doesn't just happen with simulation. There's a certain uncertainty in a simulation that is basically too large to resolve a really good launch vehicle. You need to go out there and basically simulate the real physics and break things, understand where the absolute limitation is, and then apply a margin only after you found that to basically resolve something that's also reliable. This is a process that a lot of engineering fields don't do. They don't offer that. It's truly unique to the space engineering sector, in particular, if you build and develop launch vehicles. And I think it's in hindsight for me, it's the best education you can get after university. So come um, apply at Rocket Factory. And we have lots of open positions that we still want to fill. And if you're super motivated, then there's a good chance that we will be able to welcome you here in Augsburg one day. That's fantastic. How can people follow along with your development? Where can they find the careers page and how can they follow along? We basically have a social media team um, that is very active. We have people like you that basically um, do interviews, but social media is the, the best basically place to engage. And um, yeah, if that is not enough, then go to the career website and apply for a job. Awesome. Well, Stefan, thank you so much for your time and insight into everything RFA today. We wish you and the team all the best. Zach, I really appreciate all the questions. Really fantastic, great questions. What would be even better would be to welcome you here in Augsburg or even at our test site and show you around live and for you to see it firsthand that would give you a totally different impression than me sitting here in this meeting room. Take the opportunity, come down, fly over, and we're going to spend a couple of hours and I'll show you everything firsthand. Sounds great. Thank you so much.